Well, praise the Lord, everybody. This is the Christian and the culture. How do we deal with life's conflicts, with the things that are consistently coming against us as we attempt to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm your host, Bishop Eric Lambert of Bethel Deliverance International Church, and as always, joining me here uh, on this broadcast are my co-host, Pastor Brian Weatherspoon of Tabernacle Harvest Church in Pottstown, and Pastor Tim Baldwin of Bethel Deliverance Church Northeast. Gentlemen, will you greet our audience today? God bless, and culture God bless you, Christian and the culture family. <laughs> Welcome to the show today. We pray that uh, you enjoy today's broadcast. As we always say, uh, stay tuned. Uh, we have a great uh, topic and some uh, great uh, dialogue coming up. Pastor Amen. Brian? Right off of Pastor Tim, uh, get ready, uh, just take a seat and uh, get some notes. We're going to have a really good time on the Christian culture. God bless you. Well, praise the Lord. Gentlemen, it is so good to be back today to share with our listening audience some biblical <clears throat> truths to help them navigate these difficult waters called life. You know, yeah. God left us here on this planet, and I believe that we were supposed to be qualitatively different that we should not be caught up in the things of the world, but represent the kingdom of heaven. Now, in our Amen. last broadcast, we talked about three churches in the book of Revelation that I feel speak to the position of the body of Christ today. Those churches were Ephesus, Laodicea, and Thyatira. And so we need to understand what God is saying to us through those three churches and how we can best serve the Lord as we apply the message that Jesus gives to the angels of those churches. Now, we Amen. discussed the fact that the church of Ephesus was guilty of working too much and not loving the Lord. So we've already exhausted the, the concept that we can be working for the Lord and be so involved in church work that we drift away from Him. So we want to encourage everyone to find balance, work for the Lord, yeah. but spend time with him and let him know you love him. Now, the next church for examination, we're going to go out of order. Obviously, if we go in order, the next church would be Thyatira, but I don't want to do sure. Thyatira at this point. I want to look at Laodicea. Now, when Jesus talks to that church, there is no real uh, appreciation for what they do. It just seems to jump right into condemnation. So when we look at that church, gentlemen, can you draw a parallel between the church in 2020 and that first century church in Laodicea? Pastor Tim? Yes, absolutely, Bishop. <clears throat> we know the church at La Laodicea, uh, that phrase there, uh, you're lukewarm. Uh, he says, you need a hot nor cold, you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And what he's really talking about um, is their lukewarm faith. They were prosperous, they were industrious, they're, they're a great uh, commercial center um, there in the region, uh, but, but they, had, they had lukewarm faith. And when you look at the church today and the Church of Laodicea, there is a correlation uh, between uh, what we're seeing now and then. We, we are great as it relates to uh, being industrious and commercialized and prosperous, but our faith, even down to the current election, our faith we, we, we put our faith in people instead of putting our faith and our trust in the Lord, where we see so many believers distraught about who won, you know, or who is going to win all of those things. And instead of saying it doesn't matter who just won all. The only thing that matters is that Jesus is Lord and, and, and the sovereignty of God will not cease to happen. Amen. I, I, I'm uh, on overload from election stuff. And yes. I don't want to. I don't want to talk about it, hear about it, read about it, think about it. I voted I'm five times, and that's all you need to do. I, I think that that we, yeah. you know, and, and but I do yeah. agree that yeah. there is the mindset of the Laodicean church where we start doing things on our own and really looking for how we can best serve ourselves. But Pastor Brian, I know that this has been a particularly favorite church of yours. Oh, and as yeah. <laughs> I thought about how we were going to discuss it, I wanted to throw you a curveball. And okay. that is, do we see a spirit of capitalism 
in Laodicea mm -hmm. that is that is the same as the church in 2020? Absolutely, sir. Uh, it became, and I was going to say that the phrase uh, the wealth or the wealthiness of the people began to weaken their faith. So there was a correlation between them growing in wealth and their faith becoming or, you know, kind of waning away. And it is very true today. I think our churches, and Pastor Tim already alluded to it, our churches are wealthier than they've ever been. Uh, more money comes to the church every Sunday. And, you know, pandemic could have knocked it off slightly or could have increased it. Uh, but we know the church is very wealthy. But with the wealth, the exchange has been our spirituality. And mm. so you can clearly see the divide and the distance because now we put a little bit more trust in what we can make and consume more than what we do ha uh, as, as by way of uh, dependency on God. See, that was the thing that bothered me the most during the election process. And I know I'm breaking my own rule, but the Bible said all <laughs> men are liars. Uh, you know, I, I, the thing that bothered me was that there was such a cry coming from the church saying that a certain individual would protect the church. Right. And I have a problem with that. Jesus said the gates of hell will not come against his church, that he not. would protect his church. When Absolutely. I see this shift, I think of Laodicea. You know, I think mm -hmm. of a group of people who are trying to make it on their own, who are trying to establish their own destiny, and it's all coming down to money. Now, Pastor Tim, we talked about capitalism. And Pastor Brian uh, just, uh, you know, said that the church at Laodicea demonstrated some capitalistic mindset that pulled them away from God. I want to get back to this again, because I've really done some research about capitalism and the church. And I know we talked a little bit about it. We danced around it a little bit in our last uh, gathering. But I want you to give me your gut reaction and give our audience your gut reaction. Should the church be capitalistic? The church. Should the church be capitalistic? <laughs> uh, you start in trouble. That's trouble. <laughs> My gut reaction, no, because oh. capitalism is, is really a spirit. It really is. It's a spirit mm. of consumption, a spirit of gathering, a, a spirit of... Um, um, uh, selfishness. And so, no, the church should not be steeped in capitalism. You know, the one thing that we always talk about is helping others, the widow, the poor, the, 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 you know, um, the orphans, all of those things. And it's, it, you know, it goes without saying the church needs finances to do those things, but I think it's important as to how we go about getting those finances. And I don't think that the church should be capitalistic because again getting into that kind of mindset and being being controlled by that something is going to lack you're going to compromise in some area if you're controlled by capitalism yeah i like that capital uh, uh to compromise absolute capitalism pastor brian uh when we look at laodicea you remember jesus said you think you're rich but you're poor you know, yep. you, you, he said, come buy I salve from me so that you could see. Right. It appears that he's trying to tell them that they're really an impoverished church that's spiritually blind. How do you feel Absolutely. about that in comparison to now when we see so many beautiful buildings going up? Our pastors and our preachers seem to be affluent. There seems to be yeah. a disconnect from, as Pastor Tim said, caring for the orphans and the widows, taking care of those who are destitute. We seem to be disconnected from that, just like the yeah. church at Laodicea. Now, yes, how, do you, how, do you, how do you take those two examples of the church today and the church at Laodicea and try to form a Christological worldview? Wow. Uh, so the word, the term, yeah, that was a real curveball on that one. Uh, so the term, <laughs> it's your uh, day. Let me start. <laughs> <laughs> Land to see it really, you know, in Greek, it, it really means kind of the people rule. And so the church is all about the people. So it's all about what the people want. And obviously, one of the implications is that those around, and we know that uh, around Ephesus and Thyatira, in between those two, these were very, very wealthy places. So something tells me that the folks that were the members of this church were very affluent, probably those who sold the ISAD. They probably had those who were selling the purple linen in, within their congregation. 
And so, you know, uh, higher monies, you probably spoke to more um, amassing more money. But somewhere in there, when Jesus deals with them, he says, but somewhere in it, there has been a compromise. And a compromise has caused you to be lukewarm. And if I'm really going in, in depth into that, I'm thinking those who were the rich, those who put their trust in the money and the ISAB and built their popularity off of such things around all the other little cities, uh, were, were the ones running the show within the church uh, because they had the money. So their capitalistic mindset of amassing more, amassing more, but then using it to control what sounds like one of the angelosses in the churches, uh, he's using it to control. And the Lord deals with that and says, you, you can't make it this way. You know, if you don't get back, you know, it's going to be some real shutdown. So the people were the ones running the show. The pastor was the one dancing in between the lines of what's right and what's wrong and making a compromise for money. Now, that's interesting because the early Catholic Church and Catholic is just universal. You know, it's, yes. it's it, later on, it, it kind of morphed into something a little more denominational. But early yes. on, the leaders of the church lived lives that were dedicated to God, and their desire was to fulfill Ephesians chapter 4, to equip the yes. people to do the work that God has ordained for the church to perform yes. in the world. Pastor Tim talks about this all the time, caring for orphans and widows and things of that nature, someone wrote to us and said that uh, capitalism really is the result of hard work. And if a person works hard, they should be able to keep what they have. And we're not opposed to that. We're not opposed no. to a person being rewarded for hard work. But yes. I'm going to ask Pastor Tim the question, how much is enough? How much is enough? Yeah. Uh, With all uh, my hard work, oh how much is goodness. enough? At what point do I say... According to Paul's writings to the church at Ephesus, he says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, so that he may have to give to those who do not have. So, Pastor Tim, how much is enough? Bishop, I was about to say that. that, that, that such a great reminder of, of that text, because, again, it's not about... It depends on the person. Let's say we are following the heart of the Lord. We are following the scriptural pattern for our lives. Having more is not about just having and hoarding. Having more, as the scripture says, is to give. It's better to give than to receive. It's, you know, the, the world says, if you want to be rich and prosperous, get as much as you can and hold on to it and hoard it to yourself. The Bible says, if you want to be blessed, give. Yeah. And so if you look at it from that perspective, if I'm going to truly, uh, from a biblical perspective, walk the word out, having more means that I'm able to give more and to do more. But if I have a capitalistic mindset, having more just means that I have more, mm -hmm. that I have more for myself, that I have more to, 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 to do pleasurable things with and to, to live my life from a lavish perspective. So again, it depends on the person, but if we're talking about a sold out believer, a believer who's going to walk out the word, getting means that I give as much as I can possibly give. And, and it's true. We all know that when you give, God has this way of giving back yes. and, and allowing you to be blessings to other people. And so, so when you give, when you, when you receive, it's not necessarily for you. Yeah. But well, is that giving? Now, I know the law of sowing and reaping yeah. states, you reap what you sow, sure. uh, and I, I kind of wonder, my theology is becoming challenged because for many years, especially in Pentecostalism, we were taught that if you sow money, you're going to reap money right. because the law of sowing and reaping means if you sow apple seeds, you're going to get an apple tree, not an orange tree. Right. However, I am a little challenged by that because I have not been sick since 1985. I have not had a cold, the flu or anything since 1985. Now, I believe that that's a, uh, for me, just for me and my theology, it's that that's a way of God blessing me for being obedient in the giving. So his gift back to me is good health. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Pastor Brian, Pastor Brian, when we look over at Laodicea, and there's an operative word there, lukewarm. Yeah. Lukewarm. What yeah. makes us lukewarm? Is it that we look for 
what we sell. So if I give $1,000, you know how it is today. Oh, we have a money line. Give $1,000. Should I look for thousands back, you know, or if it doesn't come, is my faith challenged now and I become lukewarm? What is it? What does it mean to become lukewarm? Yeah, uh, and lukewarm really means to exchange the value, mm. and and when you when you give more over to trusting in money, this is why Jesus dealt with this yes. very early on before the church's inception. He said, "You cannot uh, serve two masters. Wow. You're going to love one, despise the other one, and uh, you know you can't serve God and Mammon, Greek word mammonos. And so something tells me that, and and we're learning, we're seeing it. And, and we say it all the time, money has a way of changing a person. And the more a person gets, if they're not rooted and grounded, and I do not believe God wants you poor. I do want I, I do believe God wants you to prosper. And I do believe there's a nature of getting so that you can give. I'm totally with that. However, when the thing starts to get you, and when you start to change or exchange the value, so now praying, seeking God, being with him in his presence, when you get more, the challenge is, will you exchange what you do for him and, and, and give more to what you do for your money? And lukewarmness means on some level, you've made such an exchange that God can't tell whether you're hot or cold. Wow. And yeah, so, so we've exchanged it. And there's a whole principle on how we really exchange and the first one to do this kind of exchange was the one that was thrown out of heaven, and that was Lucifer. That's pretty good. Uh, I want to ask you <laughs> both a question, uh, and, and uh, we'll take a few moments to answer. But in looking at the church at Laodicea and their desire to really just chase after the material, yeah. we see God being pimped out today. The anointing is being <laughs> pimped out uh, you know, just yes, whatever sir. God gives me, everything goes into a book. Now, I don't have a problem with writing a book based on theological research, study, and things Absolutely. of that nature, and then you just give it out. You know, you put it together, you get it published. God bless you. But if God gives you a specific message for everyone, and you put it in a book and you say, all right, if you want to get this prophecy, if you want to get this message, you have to buy the book. I'm asking you, gentlemen, over in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, I basically, and I'm paraphrasing, Paul says, I went to heaven and I received an abundance of uh, information and revelation, right. and I was forbidden to explain or try to express what I saw. But yeah. now it seems like people go to heaven and they come back and they write about it and they make a lot of money off of it. Are we becoming... Yeah. Laodicean searching out, taking the things of God, pimping God out. All right, I got this anointing, this special visit from God. Now I'm going to charge you $19.95 for you to know what God is saying. Are we oh, guilty yes. then of shifting from the mindset that God left us here to be revelators, to reveal who he is, what he is, and what he's saying? Yes. Should we charge for the work of the ministry. Now, that's for both of you. We'll start with Pastor Tim and come back over to Pastor Brian. <laughs> um, absolutely not. Now, here is, let me, let me explain myself, because I agree with you that uh, writing and those types of things, uh, doing books, I, I don't have any problem with that. Right. But for instance, if, if I'm saying to you, or if you're saying, hey, listen, Pastor Tim, we want you to come to our church, we want you to preach, and I say, man, I have a word from the Lord, a revelation from on high, but I can only give it to you if you can pay me a certain amount. If we look at that from a Christological perspective, Jesus didn't charge right. to, to reveal who he was or to reveal the kingdom. There's a passage in John where it says that Jesus is um, the expression or, or the word is exogenomai, which is where we get exegesis from. He said that That's Jesus... Right the revelation of who God is. And every time he opens his mouth, he reveals who God is. 
when he opens his mouth and through that people learn to live and to and to and to trust God and to all of those things. So so again that goes back to that capitalistic mindset, Bishop. Absolutely not. The church should not be in the business of charging for the things of God, revelation, the word of God. It, listen, if if I can only come to your church if you pay me sixty thousand dollars, I, I think there is a there is a reckoning coming. Yes. Or, I agree. Yeah. It's like that. If I, I say that I am the anointed one from God and I really have a word, then it's my responsibility to get that word to where it needs to be. And if it means on my own dime, then it means on my own dime. Because here's what I believe. Mm -hmm. God will never allow himself to owe you anything. Amen. 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 <laughs> Pastor Brian. Yes, sir. I, I, I think, um, you know, I need about 25 minutes for this, but I'm going to do it in just one. You only got two. Uh, <laughs> okay, two. So, we, you know, once again, we deal with uh, Lucifer's fall. And I, I want to bring this in just because we're talking about exchanging something. And, you know, he was the anointed cherub that covers. And we know part of that, when you study that and you kind of delve into that, it wasn't that he just stood in front of the glory of God and kind of let it radiate through him, which was a prominent piece of what he did. But the scripture says his best gift was that he could trade. So there's something in heaven that he did, which was some kind of exchange mechanism in heaven that angels could see what he was doing and become enamored by it. Mm. Somewhere over the glory, there's kind of the image that he would cover the glory. And at some point he coveted it, the glory. And so that means he could give out some and could not give it out. Uh, he could show some and could not show some because he started to think it was his. And so he could give it and get it. And it's the same thing we're doing with Revelation now. If God is giving Revelation, then like many are doing, they're coveting what they've gotten for free. And it's really not theirs. It's the glory of God. It's the revelation of God. And when you begin to price it, what you're doing now is you're exchanging the glory and the gifting of God for mammon. Wow. And this is where we're seeing the watering down of the church. Money has risen but our sin has gone way through the roof because we have exchanged it for money a long time ago. Wow. That's a dangerous place uh, to be uh, to be in. I think we are not thinking Christologically. No. The, the modern church has drifted, just like Laodicea, to a place of personal prominence. Again, let me uh, go back to the election process. All we keep hearing is, oh, vote for this person, not this person, because they're going to persecute the church. They're supposed to persecute the church. The it's church is not a friend of the world. They are supposed to hate us. They're supposed to yeah. try to shut us down. How do we know this power works unless it's tried? Wow. We've spent the better part of 50 years enjoying church and not walking in the power of God. Like the Laodiceans, we've been sitting around eating our own food, blessing the blessed, healing the healed, delivering the delivered, while those that are on the outside are sitting there waiting for a word, but they can't afford to bring in the supernatural power of God because the price wow. is so high. Mm. But Jesus mm. said to the church at Laodicea, and I believe he's saying it now, you need to come sit with me and buy gold yeah. from me that's been tried in the fire. You need to let mm. me anoint your eyes so that you can see what I'm doing. You need Ooh. to let me fix your heart so that you will know what it really means to be a Christian. Being a Christian <laughs> is not about possessing things. It's about being possessed by God. We trust that the word today has encouraged you, challenged you. And as always, we welcome your comments. We welcome your responses because this program is designed to help you face yourself and think. Thanks wow. for joining us today. I'm Bishop Eric Lambert. Pastor Brian Weatherspoon. And Pastor Tim Baldwin. And we thank you for joining us on The Christian and the Culture. And remember, don't get so caught up in who wins an election. You get caught up on who's sitting on the throne of your heart. Yes. God can take care of this world. He's been keeping yes, the universe in place since the fall of man. And believe me, 
God is neither Republican nor Democrat or independent or, or green. <laughs> God is God. Yes. And without him, we can do nothing. Yes, sir. I call your attention to the book of Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar made a bold statement about his ability and God judged him for his selfishness and his arrogance. And when he came mm. out, he said, the Lord is God. So we yes. want you to know the Lord is God. God bless you. Discover God's design for family through Bishop Eric Lambert's sermon series, Strengthening the Family. This powerful series will provide you with practical instruction on how to strengthen your family relationships using scriptures from the Word of God. Receive the five-part series, Strengthening the Family, on CD or DVD for your donation of $35 or more. To order, call 1-800-550-3284 or visit ericlambertministries.org. Get your copy of Strengthening the Family so you can build a family life that brings victory to your home and glory to God. Bishop Eric A. Lambert Jr. is committed to influencing our culture with Christ. In his book, The Christian in the Culture, Bishop Lambert explores practical ways to avoid becoming ensnared by the trends of today's culture. Order your copy of The Christian in the Culture and achieve daily victorious living. Visit ericlambertministries.org to purchase the book and discover more resources that will enrich your Christian walk. The Bethel Deliverance app is now available to download for free at Apple Store and Google Play. You can tune into Sunday services through live stream, view video sermons on demand, listen to audio messages through podcasts, send prayer requests, communicate through social media, and you can contribute to the ministry simply by using today's technology. Get access to all of Bethel's media outlets and church events right at your fingertips. Go to the Apple Store or Google Play and download Bethel Deliverance to get connected today. Praise the Lord. I'm Bishop Eric Lambert. I want to welcome you to the Eric Lambert Ministries website. On this website, you will be able to get information about books, CDs, DVDs, and even the printed word designed to help you in your walk with Christ. You'll find information about our YouTube channel and the services that we have at Bethel Deliverance International Church. And we want you to understand that our ministry is designed to lift up Jesus, to glorify his name, and to get you, the listener, connected to the power of the Holy Ghost. I am excited about the Eric Lambert Ministries website, and I want you to join us as often as you can, and we guarantee two things. You'll have a closer walk with Jesus. Number two, your life will be richer. God bless you. Access resources that will enrich your Christian walk today by visiting ericlambertministries.org. That's ericlambertministries.org. The Climbing Higher broadcast with Bishop Eric A. Lambert Jr. is a part of the media outreach ministry of Bethel Deliverance International Church. Our goal is to reach the world with powerful messages of faith, truth, and victory taught from God's Word. You can take part in this significant mission by becoming a media partner. Your weekly, monthly, or one-time gift goes directly towards reaching the masses with life-changing messages of hope from God's Word. To find out more, visit the BethelDeliverance.org media link for additional information about our partnership options. We thank you for your seeds of support. The Christian and the Culture is a production of Bethel Deliverance International Church.